Hello everyone. Over the past little while, government deficits have been in the news big time. Uh, especially in uh, Alberta. We've had reports that the provincial deficit is uh, heading for well above ten billion dollars. And the federal deficit is looking just as ridiculous, or even more so. There's also been talk about how to fund uh, services uh, in, in an environment where there's no resources left to do it. Now, I always wondered how the money system actually functions. It's uh, the sort of thing that I think about. And I did some research on it ages ago. I've made videos about that in the past. But the thing that uh, I wonder about these days is why a government with sovereign authority to issue currency borrows money from uh, private interests and so on at interest instead of just printing the money that it's going to spend. Now obviously there's risks if you just spend money without any kind of a check on what's being spent. You could end up with things with the uh, dreaded hyperinflation, uh, which is definitely a bad thing. You don't want hyperinflation. The thing is, it's actually pretty easy to avoid hyperinflation, even if you're printing money. You just have to make sure that the total amount of money you put into circulation is enough to support the current operation of the economy without leading to substantial inflation. If you add too much money, you'll get inflation. If you add too little, you get deflation. Or you get a stalled economy that can't operate. And if you add just the right amount, on average, you get no inflation whatsoever. Now, with the recent financial crisis, uh, which incidentally is far from over, uh, it doesn't matter what anyone tells you, there has been no recovery. It has not recovered. The metrics that people are using to decide if recovery has happened or not do not measure the real economy. Most people are, that are analyzing it are looking at stock market values and things like that. That does not measure the real economy. In fact, it, it largely measures a parasitic economy that has been draining the life out of the real economy for centuries. But it's per accelerated particularly over the past 50 to 70 years. So, I said it was easy to avoid hyperinflation by simply not printing too much money. The problem is, how do you identify how much is too much money? Well, you would have to examine the economy and take a look at various metrics, how prices are going up or down, and add money or remove money from circulation to... Uh, stabilize the inflation rate. Now normally you're not going to remove money from circulation uh, when simply producing less will give you the right result. Uh, you would have to have a pretty catastrophic situation economically to have to actually reduce the money supply in uh, today's uh, circumstances. Uh, with an ever-increasing population there is an ever-increasing demand for additional currency to keep the economy functioning. 
Now, if you had a declining population, then you could very well end up with a deflationary situation where you actually do have to take money out of circulation. That's accomplished the same way we take money out of circulation now, taxes. And you wouldn't get rid of taxes. You'd, you'd actually need to maintain your tax regime, and you'd also need to maintain government spending in a balanced manner. Money that is added to the economy, uh, say created by the central bank, uh, that could be distributed to the economy in a number of ways. It could be distributed as a check to every citizen. It could be spent by the government on infrastructure uh, or government programs. Uh, but the government itself would have to live within its means. And while this new money added to the economy would be part of its means, it would have to be treated the same way as any other windfall type funding source. And if it was treated that way, then you know taxes would still exist. They might be lower, they might be higher or whatever. Spending would be kept in check. And if you had too much money in the economy then the, and you had uh, rampant inflation, then the, you give the government less money to spend. Uh, from this um, this uh, windfall money creation thing. Now, there's another problem with this that, that makes the hyperinflation thing much more problematic, and that's the way the banking system works. Uh, we have this uh, notion of fractional reserve lending, which is the idea that you can lend, if you're a licensed uh, lender under the regime, you can lend more money than you actually have. Which now means you're not actually lending money, because lending means you're taking something of your own and giving it to somebody else for a limited time until they give it back to you. If you're, you cannot lend more things than you have. It is... It, it cannot be done. It does, it, you cannot do it. Lending does not work that way. Instead, under fractional reserve, the banks actually, and it's usually the banks anyway, the banks actually make loans, they call them loans, but they're not, uh, far in excess of the total amount of assets they have to back them. And better yet, these assets that they're backing these loans with, if they're backing them at all, are not necessarily liquid assets. They're not cash. Basically, if you really, really study it, and you are honest with yourself while you're doing it, most economists are part of the problem because either they understand this situation and deliberately ignore it, or they're willfully ignorant of the problem because it's obvious to anyone that takes enough time to study how it works and think about it without letting the indoctrination that, that people get coming through the school system and so on get in the way. Basically, the, the honest truth, if you are looking at it objectively, is that when a bank makes a loan, they are creating money out of thin air with a trick of accounting. Basically, they give you the loan, and that's, that goes in their books as an asset and a liability. So it balances out to zero. It's an accounting trick. But by doing that, they have created money. The problem is that these days, there's no checks on that. Years, decades ago, uh, there used to be a non-trivial reserve amount required. Uh, I don't know what it was, but it was a lot more than it is today. Uh, even, say, a 20% reserve would substantially curb the... Uh, 
inflationary tendencies of the money creation uh, that the fractional reserve lends itself to. And if we still did most of our transactions with hard currency, actual paper money, then there would still have to be enough physical currency in circulation produced by the central bank to cover the current uh, transactions that are going on in the economy. But these days, with the advent of uh, checks, credit cards, and later uh, totally digital transactions, now you don't need that physical currency from the central bank to support the economic activity. At least you don't need near so much of it. That means the banks have to maintain a much smaller actual reserve of physical currency to support the people that do need physical currency once in a while. And it also means that the vast majority of the medium of exchange, which is what people think of as money, is just your bank account balances. That means that the banks control just about the entire money supply for any particular nation. And that is part of the problem. Now, these days, there's pretty much no reserve requirement. So any kind of a uh, loan is creating money out of whole cloth. And it needs to be paid back with interest. Now, here's the thing. The banks keep the interest. And when you pay back the loan, money gets destroyed. It disappears by that same accounting trick in reverse. So the banks are now taking the interest that they've earned by lending something that doesn't exist... And when, it, when that thing that doesn't exist is repaid, it disappears, but the interest that they've been repaid still exists on their balance sheet as a profit. Now, if you think about this carefully, you realize that this entire fractional reserve lending scheme is an institutionalized fraud. It just happens to be a fraud that governments have been tricked into allowing to happen. If anybody else, other than these licensed banks, tried to lend something they don't have at interest and expect to be paid back in real things at interest, they'd be put in prison. That's a bloody Ponzi scheme, or various other pyramid schemes and so on. See, it, it, it's, uh, it's so reprehensible when you really look at the underlying mechanics of it. I think most people that, under, that think they, that, that they get to it and they start actually understanding it, they shy away from it because they think it can't be right that the entire world economy runs on top of a massive, institutionalized, global fraud. Now, let's go back to the government you know, and the borrowing of money. Over the past 50 years, the government's ability to fund programs has steadily eroded. And it's not that government revenues haven't kept pace with inflation, even when you account for real inflation, the, the actual real increase in costs and not the carefully calculated one that economists use to make it look not so bad. Uh, so the, the actual real cost of these things has not gone up so, so much that we shouldn't be able to pay for them especially given how much taxes have gone up in the meantime. 
we're paying more taxes today than we were 50 years ago. At least uh, that's my, my feel on the matter. I haven't done the actual research on it. But I'm pretty sure if you actually add it up, there's been a net increase in taxation since the uh, 1960s. Now, why does this increase in tax revenue that has happened faster than inflation and population growth can account for been insufficient to cover the increased costs of providing the services over the same length of time. Why is it so much harder today to fund uh, enough teachers for a thousand students than it was 50 or 60 years ago? Why is it so much more difficult for a single uh, income family to even get to the poverty line, let alone above it. Uh, we see these movies and TV shows about that nuclear family where the dad is working, the mom is at home maintaining the house, and don't get me wrong, uh, both of those are important jobs whether they were recognized as such at the time. And then you have the kids, and the dad goes to work, he works 9 to 5, or whatever he does, he comes home, he can pay the mortgage on the house, he can pay for food, and the, the family lives reasonably comfortably. But you can't do that anymore, and that's due to uh, the couple of things, a massive increase in house prices, and that's due to speculation by these same fraudsters that run the banks. And increased taxation. So, why do we have this big problem? Well, let's take a look. I don't have the numbers on this, but you can easily back this up by doing some real quick research. This is public information that you can get from your local governments. Take a look at, over time, the percentage of revenue that's going to debt service costs. If you take a look at that, don't look at the overall total debt. Look at the percentage of revenue going toward debt service costs. If the relative level of debt stays the same, then the debt servicing cost should stay relatively stable. Uh, modulo fluctuating interest rates, but if you average it over time, uh, it should stay relatively stable. You know, fluctuating up and down. But if you take a look over the past few decades, you'll find that the percentage of debt service cost, the percentage of revenue going to debt service costs has been steadily rising. And uh, from the graphs that I recall looking at a little while ago, it's not rising linearly either. Although a linear rise in that is also not sustainable, it looks like it's rising exponentially. So, if it's rising exponentially, well, that's a real problem. And, see, this is why we're having so much trouble funding government programs, why we can't fund infrastructure maintenance, why we, let alone building new things. Why, why we can't do any of this stuff is because of the massive increase in debt service costs. Now, there's two ways we can solve this problem. We can eliminate the fractional reserve and have the central bank or somebody acting on behalf of the government but at arm's length uh, monitor the economy and 
produce new money as necessary to keep inflation on target. That will be a lot more effective than trying to manipulate interest rates to affect lending decisions of uh, commercial entities that have no interest in the greater good whatsoever. Now, we could, we could do it that way. That does require some substantial regulation changes. It's going to hit a lot of resistance from the people with money, who are only the people with money because they've gamed the system so that they're the only people that can have the money, uh, pretty much. Um, but if, if we, and this should be our long-term goal to, to eliminate fractional reserve altogether because it is fraud and take away the power to create new money from commercial entities that are motivated only by their own, usually short-term, gain. The other thing is we could simply let the government print money when it's going to borrow it instead of just borrowing it. Now, you may wonder why that wouldn't lead to hyperinflation. Well, it's quite simple. The government borrows the money from, say, the Bank of Canada, and then it spends it on programs or in, on infrastructure, whatever. It spends it into the economy. Well, that is money that's now in circulation, which can now serve as uh, potential... Uh, reserves for banks to lend against if they even needed reserves. So it wouldn't actually prevent, uh, or rather, it wouldn't actually cause any further inflation than it already does now when the governments borrow billions of dollars to spend on infrastructure and programs and so on. The money is still going into circulation whether they borrow it or print it. It makes no difference the, uh, to the total money in circulation as a result of spending that money. If you're borrowing it into existence or you simply manufacture it into existence. So why don't we, instead of borrowing it at interest, which then has to be paid back to... Uh, these moneyed people that uh, are manufacturing the money where the government's borrowing out of thin air anyway, but then charging interest on it for the privilege. Instead of doing that, why not simply have the Bank of Canada add the amount of money the government need, decides to borrow to their bank account? Now, if you want to maintain, manage the, like, uh, keep track of how much the government has borrowed, you could still lend it. So that there's a record of, of that, and then the government, and you could still require the government to repay it. But since it's clear that repaying the government debt is going to reduce the money in circulation too much, and it will hamstring the economy, well, clearly the government's going to keep borrowing more, but they're not going to pay back an appreciable amount. Not over the long term. So why not have the Bank of Canada lend the necessary money to, to fund government operations at a mandatory 0% interest rate? That is, the government of Canada would and the provincial governments in Canada they need the same power because both levels can run substantial deficits. Allow them to borrow money from the Bank of Canada at 0% interest. It could be term, uh, term securities, bonds, you know, the equivalent of bonds, that need to be paid back when they come due. But if they're borrowed at 
then the governments don't rack up this huge debt servicing cost just to keep enough money in circulation that the economy doesn't stall. Now, it's obvious, if you think about it, that borrowing money at 0% has absolutely no difference to actually just printing the bloody money, right? And the Bank of Canada, that's what they do. They print money. That's their purpose. They, man they manage the Canadian dollar. So, uh, why not authorize them to create money to support government operations? If the government's going to borrow the money anyway, then we might as well uh, give it to them. Uh, if it causes runaway trouble with the economy, well, that you can't prevent the government from doing that. You can't prevent a government from tanking its own economy. You can put some checks and balances on it, and you would need something to uh, keep a handle on government spending. So you'd need to have uh, some sort of live within your means type uh, uh, oversight. But as long as inflation is staying pretty stable, and that's another topic uh, that uh, I could go on at length about is uh, what's a good inflation rate. Um, as long as inflation is staying pretty stable, then it means that there isn't too much money in circulation. Now, you might be wondering uh, why the government spending money into existence is a better choice than letting then uh, this quantitative easing thing that uh, has been all the rage the past decade or so. The problem with quantitative easing, easing and trickle-down economics, which it really is, uh, Reaganomics, whatever you want to call it, is that it functions on the assumption that by making it easier to get money, to get credit, for the top levels of the uh, economy. That's the rich people. It trickles down to improve things for the poor people, which we can see over the past 35 years, it has not happened. The rich people have gotten uh, ridiculously richer, and the poor people, while they, they may be slightly better off, are actually not any better off, really, from an economic standpoint. Uh, at least when the, the butcher bill comes due for the way uh, the economies have been running uh, uh, lately. And if you think these recent financial crises are an any indicator of uh, that we might have actually had to pay the butcher's bill, no, we haven't yet. And when it happens, it's going to be terrifying. Because when it happens, Everything that's too big to fail will fail. That means the banks will go bankrupt. Governments will default. And when that happens, and it will happen if we keep going the way we're going, when that happens, it's not the rich guys that are going to suffer, except for a small handful. It's everybody else that's going to suffer. Now, I could go on and talk about uh, why just printing money is uh, a valid option. Uh, you know, it doesn't that just mean currency is worthless? Well, that, that's a, a big topic on its own. But yes, the currency itself is worthless, except as a scorekeeper for ongoing economic activity. Money is only worth something because we're using it to keep score, basically. And that's why an unbacked fiat currency, it's not backed by any asset, actually works pretty well. And why a limited supply commodity such as gold is a long-term non-starter for 
for uh, maintaining any size of economy. Anyway, basically what this long rant boils down to is that instead of borrowing money at interest, our governments should just be able to either borrow at no interest or such a negligible interest rate that it doesn't really matter, like 0.01% or something like that. Uh, and then they, they should be able to spend that. Yeah, instead of having to borrow at uh, on the open bond market at anywhere, you know, from uh, depending on the uh, state of things, you know, where where if your credit rating goes down, suddenly your debt servicing costs skyrocket, like what happened to Greece. Uh, granted, Greece had some real mismanagement going on, so it's not entirely the financial system that screwed them over, but uh, still. Uh, governments should not be borrowing money at interest, at least not the federal level, if they're responsible for their own currency. And all sovereign nations should be using their own currency. Uh, and I, I used to think something like the euro was a great idea. I don't anymore. I think it's a really dumb idea. Um, every sovereign nation needs to maintain its own currency or it needs to have its own central bank at the very least. Okay, so that's basically my the thing. Governments shouldn't be borrowing money at interest uh, to finance their debts. Uh, they shouldn't even have to be financing debts to increase the money supply, and that's really what's been going on. Um, I will say, prefix that by saying that a short-term debt that has a reasonable expectation of being paid back on a very short time scale is reasonable to have an interest rate attached to it. But money that's being borrowed to increase the money supply must not ever have interest attached to it. And the ultimate end game, as I've said, is to eliminate fractional reserve completely. And that includes short selling on stock markets. That should be illegal too. Uh, anything where you're selling something you don't have or lending something you don't have should be uh, the fraud, regarded as the fraud that it actually is. And then the governments can print their money as they require, and life is really no worse off than it is now. Uh, we still have the risk of hyperinflation from massive overspending. We still have the uh, risk of hyperinflation from uh, banks lending too much money. So, yeah, it's uh, it's not going to make the risk of hyperinflation worse. That's what I'm saying. So, uh, anybody who has any power to change anything, if you're watching, take a look at the various proposals out there for money reform. They'll all lead you to an end game that's compatible with what I'm saying here. Uh, all of the credible ones currently, like positivemoney.org. Uh, anything that's talking about using a fixed commodity as money is not credible. Uh, there's whole good reasons for that. And if you take a look at some of the uh, videos and uh, research out there on money and how it works and where it came from, and so on, you'll actually understand why something like gold or a fixed commodity doesn't work well as a currency long term. Well, that's enough rambling for now. Um, I'm going to conclude by saying that if we would get smart about this and stop borrowing money at interest to increase the money supply,
then government debt servicing costs would be substantially lower and we could take that revenue that is currently going to debt servicing and spend it on these programs and we'll suddenly find out that we really can pay for these things that that we want health care and so on so if you've watched this this far thanks for watching remember to subscribe to be notified of uh, new videos and I'll see you next time